Maureen Corrigan, book critic for NPR's Fresh Air, is the Nikki and Jamie Grant Distinguished Professor of the Practice and Literary Criticism at Georgetown University. She is an associate editor of and contributor to Mystery and Suspense Writers and the winner of the 1999 Edgar Award for Criticism presented by the Mystery Writers of America. In 2019, Maureen was awarded the Nona Balakian Citation for Excellence in Reviewing by the National Book Critics Circle. And hailed as smart and funny by people, Gina Bareka was deemed a feminist humor maven by Miss. She has written for most major publications, including the New York Times, the Chronicle of Higher Education, Cosmopolitan, and the Harvard Business Review. Board of Trustees, Distinguished Professor at UConn, as well as winner of its highest award for excellence in teaching, Gina's written 10 books, including the best-selling, They Used to Call Me Snow White, But I Drifted. She's appeared often as a repeat guest on CNN, PBS, the BBC, 2020, 48 Hours, The Today Show, NPR, and Oprah, as well as just having been interviewed on camera as the forthcoming American Masters series on May West as an expert on women, humor, and cultural politics. We are so excited to have them both here tonight and I'm now gonna let them take it away. Thank you so much. I am so delighted to be uh, doing an event with Maureen for RJ Julius. I mean, we, we had such a good time doing Politics and Prose, which is the Maureen's fabulous independent bookstore down in DC. And now to do the Connecticut, you know, Queen of bookstores at uh, uh, in in Madison and Wesleyan, um, and I got to see Roxanne Cody, who also is a huge fan and admirer of Maureen's, because you've come to the store. I have come to the store, and both R.J. Julia and Politics and Prose are. Oh my God, they are gifts to this country. <laughs> so. no, absolutely, absolutely, they really are. And so, you know, to support um, the kind of events where we get to play together, but play with everybody is is great. And to have a real conversation with women who love to write, and I'm sure there are women, I'm sure, God willing, there are men there and people who identify as you know, everything in between. And if we're lucky, everybody is in the conversation then. And I'm very grateful. And I know I want to give a special shout out and we'll talk about her essay later, but I know there are friends of Barbara Cooley's who are joining us this evening. And Barbara is one of the contributors, but I hope that a number of the contributors from Fast Fierce Women, um, where Maureen writes one of the great essays um, in this book. And it's the, uh, the second in a series of books that we're uh, or that I'm doing with Woodhall Press. And the first one was Fast Funny Women that came out last year. And then Fast Fierce Women came out um, at the beginning of March. And so um, Fast Fierce Women, uh, Fast Funny Women was just supposed to be, like we thought it was gonna be a one-off deal. Mm -hmm. And it did well and we had such fun doing it that I thought, well, you know, Let's keep going. You know, I've never been one to sort of you know, be the first, let's say, to leave the party. And so I thought this is still going on. And, you know, who, who was it? It was, uh, I think, um, uh, uh, oh, God, I can't remember her name. But one of, one of the great comics said, you know, never go with somebody to a second location unless you really trust <laughs> Like this is the, you know, Maybe Joan Rivers sounds like her right, right, or, or Tina Fey, but it was like, so this is the second location. So fast, fierce women. And it was one of my uh, former students, Miranda Wright, who's also a contributor to the book, who did the cover. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, just did a wonderful uh, job with sort of representing different kinds of women. But everybody came at fierce from a different angle. Uh, yeah. And so fierce is... Um, doing anything that subverts the idea of what a good girl was supposed to be. And I was raised, uh, Maureen and I have had conversations about this. Um, she was raised in Queens. You can see that, you know, that's her return address there. Queens <laughs> and I was raised in Brooklyn and Long Island and, um, and, and I raised Catholic. And where the church had, you know, one lesson, at least for women my age, I'm older than Maureen, but women my age was that, no, I think I'm you're not. You're younger than I am. No. Yeah. yeah. We'll fight about so this. we got the same lesson. <laughs> we got 
the same lesson, which was to remember that sex was something dirty and disgusting that you save for someone you love. <laughs> and that was, right, that was pretty much the summary of the Catholic Church. And so that it's like how people have, you know, substance abuse and, you know, it's like, I can't, I, 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 I am still Roman Catholic. I mean, but I don't practice it. And for other people, it's not harmful, but for me it is. So there should be meetings that I go to. Um, and, um, but I can't be anything else. So it's, it's yeah. this kind of thing. But the idea of being a good girl was something I couldn't accomplish. And to me, the alternative of being a good girl was learning how to be fierce, mm -hmm. was learning how to be um, uh, loud. Um, and, but, but uh, you, you talk about this in the piece that you're gonna read um, from, from the book, that there are lots of different ways to be fierce. And um, again, Barbara Cooley's essay, is about survival and mm -hmm. about losing um, a friend of hers. And there are a lot of essays about loss and, and survivorship yeah. is velocity. Um, uh, Nicole Caterino uh, writes about uh, having OCD and for her making um, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is an act of ferocity. She is facing um, the idea of going to a, a public park and all of that sort of exposure um, that uh, involves for Father's Day and and the immediacy of her experiences right there. Um, people like, um, again, Amy Sherman, we talked about her essay, was talking about being a flight attendant and getting the guy off the plane, but in a really, in a much more objectively fierce way. Yeah. Now, no, but there are lots of quiet ways of being fierce and lots of ways to interpret being fierce. And so when I first asked you, Maureen, to be to, to, to grace us with part of you know your experience about being fierce, you were at first reluctant because you, you said you didn't think of yourself as fierce. Fierce does not is is still not a, a word that resonates with me. Um, and it's okay. I mean, I don't have aspirations to, to make it my word, but, but um, I can connect to fierce as a way of sort of staying true to yourself and, you know, keeping focused despite what other people say or despite your own anxieties. That's a way that I can may, maybe connect to the word fierce. But I also connected to it in a different way, <laughs> and I also, you know, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I, I really, Gina and I are recent friends, but we have heard about each other for years, and I, I really so admire Gina's attitude toward writing, toward thinking about things, um, which is, you know, wide open, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, and we both went through grad school in English. We both um, kind of went through grad school at a time where, you know, it was very much um, encouraged that you be laden with theory in your conversations about literature, that you never seem like you're having too good a time. God <laughs> forbid you should laugh in, in a class or in a seminar. And so um, I still sometimes need someone like Gina to free me up and to say, just write about what you want to write about. You know, no one is grading this essay anymore. <laughs> and, um, and so that's what I did. So um, should yeah, I read it? Why don't yeah, I read it? And I'll no, stop blathering about it, but I'll, no, I'll just no, read Yes, please, because it really did, because you were, you were like, this is not, again, this is not something yeah. I connect with. And I said, I bet there's something. Yeah. Just you know, just right. And for the the advice, because I think a lot of people here are are nascent writers or emerging writers, or you know, they're they're wondering how writers work. And the idea is that it anything except writing is not writing. And that when you write, you sit down and you write. And, right. and you're correct that you the first thing you have to get rid of are all those voices in your head telling you you're not good enough, this is not gonna work. And the theory part, we could go through that because that that was this clawed sort of multiple tooth yeah. rows of tooth monster that we did have to deal with. I 
think is loosening its grip, although we could still be interesting to hear what people thought about yeah. that. But yeah. please, so when you when you got into writing about how this topic and what this meant to you, your essay is one of the best in the book, my favorite, as are the 74 other ones. <laughs> I really enjoy the book too. I just want to say I, I have been, you know, almost treating it as a reward later at night um, to say, okay, I'm going to read a few more essays. And I love Laura Rossi's es essay about, you know, homeschooling, hanging on through the pandemic and being in her kitchen with her kids and, you know, and getting them through Zoom school, you know, all the different iterations that fierce can take at different times, especially at this time. Well, okay, my essay is called Fierce Skin. Fierce is not a word that resonates with me. When I was growing up in 1960s Queens, women weren't called fierce. They were called tough, not nice, a bee, or that one sure has a mouth on her. These were the kind of women who stood outside their apartment buildings on summer nights gossiping and giving anyone who walked by direct stares. These women didn't bother to fix themselves up to do their grocery shopping. They wore house dresses and God help you if you banged into their shopping carts in the narrow aisles of the local key food. Fierce in that time and place meant mean and I was scared of mean. My mother certainly wasn't fierce. She was gentle, childlike even and so shy that she would sometimes ask the teenaged me to speak for her when she needed to return something at a store. She was always ashamed of her lack of education. During the depression, my mother had to leave high school after one year to work at a factory. Like her, I too was shy, but I had better spoken grammar. So I was her public mouthpiece. Otherwise, if you ask anyone who knew me what I was like from kindergarten through grad school, I guarantee the first thing they'll say is, she was quiet. But there was one thing about me that was fierce, my skin. In sixth grade, my skin began breaking out and kept on raging for years. When I say breaking out, I don't mean a discreet blemish here or there. I mean red, angry pimples, the kind that were called carbuncles. I have scars on my face from these pimples, and I do not wear them proudly. I see very few young people anymore with this kind of acne. There are much better treatments now for problem skin. Back then, the dermatologist my parents sent me to only had tetracycline and sun lamps in his arsenal. The sun lamps made my skin peel so that for days I'd have a face full of dead skin flakes on top of my pimples. One Saturday, I showed up to my regular dermatologist appointment and was greeted by a substitute doctor. You have dandruff of the face, he joked, looking at me. What kind of creep says that to a teenaged girl? Neighborhood experts also weighed in on my appearance. You're a pretty girl, a pharmacist once told me when I went to pick up my tetracycline, but you need to drink more water. Doesn't everybody? The fierce neighborhood women simply stared. In the second year of my appointments with that Queens dermatologist, he changed receptionists. The new receptionist was, I kid you not, one of the most beautiful girls at my high school. She was Italian with glossy black hair and alabaster skin. Every other week, I'd stand before her with my inflamed, peeling skin, counting out the cash for my treatment. She'd gaze at me with the cool, direct look of those fierce women, probably learned from her mother. Then I'd walk out of the office to the subway, enduring more stares on the ride home. Repressed memories of that era erupt like, I'm not going to finish that metaphor. There was the time in college when I applied for a part-time job at the flagship Macy's on 34th Street in Manhattan. The sympathetic woman who interviewed me told me my complexion was too bad to work on the floor as a sales girl. 
But if I came back in two weeks and my skin was better, I might be hired. I drank water for two weeks and lived on white bread with ricotta cheese. Bland food was another folkloric cure for acne. Mind over matter works for short periods, so my skin did get a little better and I got the job at Macy's. Working on the cash register in the dim corner of the Husky Boys department. My chubby customers and I surely recognized each other for what we were. Exiles from the other, better departments meant for those closer to the desired ideals of beauty. My years in graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania were not happy ones. So breakouts and a new torment, eczema, ensured that I spent many a weekend alone in my apartment reading the multi-volume works of Ruskin and Carlyle. When it came time for me to submit my dissertation, three professors were required to sign off on it. The first two were scholars in my field, Victorian literature. The third reader was randomly appointed by the administrators of Penn's then notoriously sadistic English department. Professor Y, as I'll call him, was appointed to be the third reader on my dissertation, who read it for style and punctuation. Professor Y suffered as I did from eczema, but his eczema was acute. From his scabrous scalp to his swollen red fingers, every inch of visible skin on his body was inflamed and flaking. The poor man couldn't stop scratching. I would have felt sorry for Professor Y given our kinship of troubled skin, but he was a martinet in matters of punctuation, a veritable patent of the parenthesis, a desade of the semicolon. At the scheduled time, I presented myself at his office and sat beside him for hours, going through the typescript of my dissertation, line by line, page by page, for some 266 pages. Every time he spotted an extra space after a semicolon, my trademark peccadillo, he would point a gnarled finger at the space and shake his head and he would scratch. I started scratching too out of nervousness. Gradually, every page of my dissertation became coated with flakes of dead skin. Thus it was that I passed the requirements for my PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. Decades away from all that dermatological torment, I sometimes entertain the empowering possibility that maybe my angry skin might have been speaking on my behalf, on behalf of my shy younger self. There's an old Clearasil commercial where the pimples speak or more precisely, sing in chorus as they multiply. Their song goes like this. I'm an acne pimple, lonely as can be. Don't cry, pimple, I'll keep you company. Say, fellow pimples, can three be a crowd? All together, pimples, sing real loud, schwa. <laughs> schwa, was, schwa was Madison Avenue's idea of what pimples would sound like if they could sing. Maybe my pimples were singing too. Maybe they were singing to those fierce women in my childhood neighborhood. Stop looking at me. I don't want to be like you. Maybe they were singing to the boys I was anxiously attracted to in high school. Keep your distance. I don't need any complications. Maybe in graduate school, they were singing real loud. The academic life is beautiful, but why does it have to be so nitpicking, humiliating, and hierarchical? Or maybe they were just singing, schwa. <laughs> I wasn't fierce when I was young, but my skin was. I'm tougher now. One thing I know, once you've lived with pimples as a teenaged girl, the wrinkles of age can't scare you. Yay! And I want to know from everybody listening, how many people remember the Clearasil song? <laughs> you can find it online. <laughs> That's 
and and I don't and I don't remember that. I think probably because my skin was the same thing. I had terrible acne, and anytime if I heard the word pimple or zit or anything, I I took it personally. Of course, and yeah. Somebody was looking at me, and I mean, I um, I I slathered, I spackled makeup. Oh on yeah. Yeah, I wore it to the beach. I slathered it on when we, when we went to Rockaway. <laughs> Absolutely, I was on yeah. Jones Beach, West End too, yeah. and it was, um, you know, layers. I mean, but you could have put it on literally with a trowel. I was using <laughs> grout, you know, and that it was, um, um, you know, just a way to to hold my face together, which I hated. I mean, I hated that. And I thought that it was feeling like, um, and Maureen, your essay is so wonderful because it's so honest. And, it, you know, but it was, if you're not pretty or you don't think you're pretty, yeah. right? Yeah. You don't think you're pretty as a girl. Right. Um, that it, it, you know that you're not going to be the one that somebody falls in love with across a room, right? I mean, all these yeah. movies, where somebody falls across. I thought if I could get somebody over a cup of coffee and a biscotti and 15 minutes and make them laugh, maybe they'll find me attractive. Well, but well, the thing too with having breakouts like that when you're a teenager, especially, and every, you know, everything is forming and your whole psyche is a big mess, is that um, you want to hide, but but the stuff on your face is drawing attention in, in precisely, you know, a, a, a way that's that's really like the last way you want people looking at you. you know, so it, it it's it's complicated. I, um, I I do you know, I do find that people respond when you get into these kinds of conversations and <laughs> I've told Gina I've had several men come up to me I, I read this essay when I was still working on it at a writer's conference last summer and a couple of guys came up to me later and said I was a husky boy <laughs> I mean we're all something right we're all Absolutely. something so. and that and that is that's the it's the scary part I mean it, it is because you're you have to pretend you're not yeah yeah. order to try to get away with anything and then you feel like a fake and then you feel like an imposter right. and I remember you know the first time that I let a boy see me without my makeup and I thought he was going to run down the hall yeah. I actually yeah. made him leave his shoes in my room <laughs> because I was afraid like you know he would he would go yeah. I mean I I was so, and I also think you and as you and I have spoken before but that having shy mothers to have yes. mothers who could not shield us or fight yeah. for us but in fact sort of needed us to go out and shield them yeah uh, also was you know you 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 didn't have that extra layer of protection you know you didn't yes. have yes. some do that and everybody's you know and everybody needs to be shielded and in fact when I was thinking as I was looking through this I remembered that Barbara's essay is not it's not about her friend it's about her brother and you know, that we, we need, you know, we need our family. We expect our families to be able to defend us, to help us. And we, we want to help them when they need help. But there are sometimes, if we're children mm -hmm. being asked, not when we're siblings or, you know, it's, it's hard enough when we're grownups, but when we're kids and if you're asked as a child to assume this role as an adult, um, it's very, it's, it's hard to do. And a lot of the essays in, in Fierce Women are really about um, yeah. people looking back and saying, I was asked to do this too young. Yeah. You know, even if it's by somebody who loved them, right. but it was just that moment when you didn't, ha you didn't expect to have to step up. And you did. And so I think that you, the ending of your essay is particularly, um, you know, meaningful because it is like once having gone through these battles and to have gone through this as yeah. young women, it's like 
Yeah, you want to, I've had now women come up to me and go, how come you keep your skin nice? And it's like, because it's been oily since mm-hmm. I was a right. Right. Oh. right, no moisturizer needed, right. No moisturizer. <laughs> and this is all, this is olive oil. Yeah. This yeah. is stuff that I've been eating when they, and they told us, they lied to us. They said, don't drink soda, don't, right? It was don't drink. Oh, no, yeah, but, but this is my secret weapon for events like this and, and for fresh air like drink some coke don't don't drink coke don't eat pizza and i have it's like bridges jones diary it's like i'm 11 and 12 years old and it's like i only had three cokes this week i only had you know i mean and and they were telling us this as if it was going to be some kind of cure as opposed to this is genetic they can do better now but the tetracycline you know also oh, it, it wrecks your teeth too yeah but you know they didn't know they didn't they didn't know right so you know, but they didn't know but we were paying them out of pocket <laughs> i also remember i went like twice oh yeah oh uh, no I'm, i i think it was every other week i went for years um and there was one doctor I was in college. One one dermatologist who said, "You know, here here are all the forbidden foods," and I was down to about 107 pounds in college because there was a time when I stuck to it, um, and then you know, thank God, didn't develop an eating disorder and got off. But you would do anything to try to you know make things better. Anyway, yeah. So you know, it, I feel a little um, still a little um, embarrassed about being in your collection, Gina, because, you know, in the grand scheme of what people have to deal with, oh, no, no, acne, no. it's not, it's not um, top of the list. But, you know, I, I did take, take your invitation and as, as permission to, you know, write about something that, yeah, it was a struggle for me. So. And was, and again, I think people love it the response to people when, when you're reading it. And certainly it meant a lot to me yeah. because it, it resonated so entirely with this. And I also think, you know, on some level, we need to not apologize for the stuff that made us miserable. Yeah. And, well, it could have been this miserable. <laughs> I mean, it's right. Just, right. I mean, it's like, okay, but it was miserable. I, I mean, I yeah. was, Thing. I, I hated myself. I couldn't look in a mirror. I couldn't, yeah. you know, I mean, it was, it was awful. I wore big floppy hats. I tried to put, you know, I tried to be in the Carly shade. Simon. That. <laughs> yeah, I tried to be in the shade and I had no uh, James Taylor. I mean, you know, I tried to, and, and I thought it, it again, that it made me, it, it felt like a kind of a, um, a, like a, a a way that I couldn't pass as a good girl. Mm-hmm. Like right. it made me. Yes, right, right. You don't fit that, that right. image, that mold. Yeah. So, you know, but it really, so my, my tough story um, uh, is, is it comes out of um, when I was uh, an older young woman than you but um when I was in my 30s I was divorced I was still uh I was teaching at UConn but I until I got tenure I kept my rent stabilized apartment on the Lower East Side and um there was one evening in November when the superintendent came nice guy the super had nothing to do with the land you know with the uh, with the building owners the landlords and he came and said we're going to replace where they're then they're coming and they're replacing all of the windows in the building and i was like okay that's fine so you know that, that's okay um i said I, it didn't bother me that much of, that a bunch of guys were coming over to work in the apartment i figured that would be fine they do their job it would over be over soon you know it would be better it'd be warmer in the apartment i made a big pot of coffee to show them some gratitude for their hard work i know that you know people who are coming working all day doing the, you know, the real heavy lifting is heavy lifting. I had uncles who works in construction. So and work hard, they did. Four burly men arrived uh, and removed the windows in a matter of minutes. The temperature in my apartment dropped 30 degrees and the snow started settling in on the sill as they readied the replacements. Huffing and grunting, they fitted the new windows into place. It was a problem, however, 
in that the new windows didn't fit into the frames. The new windows were the wrong size. The old windows broken now and lying in unusable pieces um, in the hallway outside my apartment door were not gonna be of any use. So we all looked at one another, the guys and me, the wind was howling like in some Dickensian way, you know, it's like, these are the children, this is want and this is ignorance, beware. The children, we'll put some plastic sheeting over the windows, the head guy explained, we'll come back tomorrow. So snow is blowing into my apartment. I live in a second story apartment on the Lower East Side and all my windows are gone. And this guy says, he's gonna put in plastic sheeting to get me through the night. It was like seven o'clock at night, and dark for three hours. So not only would my place become a tundra within the hour, but by dawn, 16 homeless people would be living with me, having made their way through the gaps in the plastic sheeting to set up house with full squatters, right? And I started a new life on the fold out couch. That's, and that's when I started to yell. That's why I started to yell. Let's just say I suggested that plastic sheeting over four windows would offer inadequate protection. And let's say I didn't say it in those words. There was silence. It wasn't really silent because the wind was picking up and loose pieces of broken wood are banging against the empty window frames as if signaling to the world that a single 30 year old was ready to receive all guests. Four large men stood in front of me as I raged because at this point, I'm going, what are you doing to me? I'm lying, what, I can't live like this, this is wrong. And I said, so how could you not make sure you had the right windows before you knocked out the old windows? How could you not do one at a time at least to make sure? More silence. The head guy paused before he met my eyes and barked, you're not perfect either, lady. And that, my friends, remains, in my experience, one of the most astonishing statements ever made to a disgruntled customer. You're not perfect either, lady. Yeah, that's true, I agreed. But I didn't just go to your house, break your windows, and then suggest you sleep under a couple of extra blankets until tomorrow. So I must have looked as fierce as I felt because within two hours, I sent a truck to Queens, got new workmen from the Bronx, and installed perfectly fitted windows. So the lesson here, you don't need to be perfect in order to insist that somebody treat you like a person. Yeah. And just because you, you offer somebody a warm greeting, you know, doesn't mean they won't leave you out in the cold. And learning how to raise hell is a useful and often underrated skill. I mean, a nicer person <sighs> said, oh, it's okay. The plastic sheeting will be enough. Or I could go stay with a neighbor. I don't know any of my neighbors. Or I'll sleep in the hall. I'll sleep in the hall. I mean, that's what a nicer person would have well, done. Well, I would still be wrestling with myself thinking, oh, they worked so hard already. And it's nighttime and blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, I, but my favorite, my favorite part of your essay, because I so identify, is you made coffee. And <laughs> You, know, you kind of almost then think you're extending this contract of, you know, yeah. you're people, I'm a person, here, have some coffee, and, you know, we'll, we'll treat each other well, you know. Which, no. which I meant. And, and again, I know that they weren't trying to do anything wrong, but it was the idea that yeah. they really were just, and the fact that they could go get the windows. Yeah. But, and they did. I mean, but if I had been nicer... Yes. I would have been sleeping in a 30 degree apartment. Oh my God. That's where the fierceness comes in. Yeah. Because they would have taken advantage. Yes. So yes. I'd be nice. So I, I would have, not have done even thought of doing that to a man. I really don't think so. I yes. really don't think so. And that a man would not have had to make an argument. Right. I mean, my husband has a deep voice. Michael has a deep voice. Yeah. And he, they wouldn't have, it wouldn't, he just would have given a look. Right. You right. just would have given a look and they wouldn't have happened. So I say, fierce women will tell you the truth and we won't sugarcoat it. We'll laugh only when your stories are funny. We'll argue until the sun goes down or comes up again without batting an eye. We don't want to settle down. We've been settled like some Western township. And now we want to kick up the dust and tear down the fences. Not only will we not settle down, we won't settle for less than what we've always wanted, which is a good time and a fair fight. 
And that's, you know, that's the idea. And that's what everybody does, you know. Um, so, you know, Suzette Martinez Standing talks about half of her face being paralyzed and having to deal with that and go through this. Um, yeah. Patricia Wynn Brown talks about wanting to kill her father, but wanting to do it like with a butter knife as a little girl. Um, Mona Friedland uh, talks about how her mom always wanted her to be perfect. And when she finally could accept the idea that it, she wasn't going to be perfect. The Mona is actually as close to perfect as you can get. Um, you know, uh, Sherry Marcucci talks about turning 50 and second acts. And there are a lot of people talking about the moment in their lives when they realized that, um, as again, Barbara Cooley's essay is called Thin Ice. When they're walking on thin ice, mm -hmm. you know, emotionally, psychologically, professionally, yeah. whatever version, but that you have to keep going. Yeah. Right? yeah. Because otherwise, I mean, otherwise you really are going to fall through and that sometimes, you know, again, the victory in life is just to keep going. Yeah. It's not, and, and, and the triumph is just going to be able to continue. It's not going to, there's not going to be some victory speech. It's not like you're going to be on a pedestal. Right. Right. No. You, it, it, you kept it, going. you yeah. didn't fold. You know, you're you're still there, and that you got your windows. <laughs> <laughs> that there's something between you and the outside world, but that you have to fight for it, yeah. and that has nothing to do with fair, and it has nothing to do with right, and that nobody should have to make any of this. You know, mm -hmm. nobody should have to fight this hard. Right, and right. so it's like. How do you learn how to do that without becoming one of those? It, we were talking about this before because I, <laughs> my office, both at home, and at home, is is like a cross between a bodega and a toy, <laughs> like how I live. And um, so this is, you know, so my first book, Anne, was they used to call me Snow White, but I drifted. It's an old May West line, and so I have a lot of. Um, Snow White uh, creatures, uh, uh, versions around. So this was one that I got, um, and there were a, a couple of versions of, of this doll. Um, so here's Snow White, who, first of all, I love that she has the seven dwarves in her pockets and that they are removable, which I think is very cute. But the real thing is, so here's the good girl, right? Here's our quintessential good girl is Snow White. She's singing Someday My Prince Will Come. But you cannot separate Snow White from the evil queen, okay? Snow White has, I mean, Gilbert and Gubar wrote about the mad woman in the attic. The mad woman is not even in another room. She's right under there. She's right <laughs> under there. And, you know, and again, I, like I said, I feel very at home. I think I've become her. You know, I would actually buy this. Like it looks like a Liberty print. I'm wearing a lot of shawls these days. I, you know, this could become a mask. I got, I think the glasses are similar. She's holding fruit. I mean, she has a nice little face. I mean, the face is very similar. You know, I got the big cheeks and the, the thing. You know, I mean, but it's all the same broad. It's all the same person. It's great. So, I mean, it, it really is great. And the, what lurks underneath, right? We're, exactly. In a good, and, and so also in a good way, the potential to let that, um, I don't know, that fiercer side out, right? It, yeah. And, and that, again, if nobody else is going to protect you, where nobody else is going to give you, even if it's not protect, I shouldn't even put it in those terms, but to inspire you, yeah, give you permission. My God, my whole life, Maureen, I've looked for permission. Mm -hmm. I just want somebody to say, it's okay to do this. Yeah. Yeah. And I try as a teacher, and I'm sure you do too, like to give students permission. Like, right. Like, it's all right to not do, you know, if you don't want to be an accountant, just because your parents said you should be an accountant, yeah. you don't have to be an accountant. Or you're allowed to be a writer. It doesn't matter if you're 50 and you haven't published right. before. Yeah. Right. Write something. Send it out. See what happens. It also doesn't mean you should stop doing your day job that gives you right. dental because you need dental. So follow <laughs> your dreams as long as you have dental. That's really my motto. I think it should be on a pillow. But shall we um, go over to let's, our- Yeah, let's, let's see let's, what other people want to uh, talk about. Yeah. Okay, so we do have a few audience questions. And just a reminder, 
If anyone does have any questions, make sure you put them in the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen. But you'll jump right in. I just wanted to start with this comment because it's so sweet from Laura. I really hope Gina and Maureen know how lovely they both are inside and out. Please tell me they see their gorgeousness now. Thank you. That was very nice, Laura. It's Thank lovely. you for that comment. <laughs> I'm just okay. going to put a scarf in anxiety. And so <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. It's like, okay. that No, and Laura, I mean, Laura was one of my students, um, you know, at the very beginning at UConn. And, uh, and Laura has always been an encourager of everybody who's ever been in her life. And she is an empress. You know, there's the empress category. And, and Laura is in that. And Maureen gave, in a way, Laura permission to keep going by saying how much you liked her essay. Oh, I love, I, I really like Laura's essay. I, I uh, again, Laura's essay is the one about uh, just sitting at that kitchen table and <laughs> helping your kids with the Zoom lessons and dealing with everything else that's going on, including, you know, your own job, your own work, um, everything on our laptops last year. If, you know, if we were fortunate enough in a sense right. to have that option, um, but it keeping it together, especially for your kids and not letting them see that, um, you know, there were some days where you just wanted to scream. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really, I, I thought her, I think her essay is important and, you know, should be in a time capsule when people ask about what this, what this period was like. That's yeah. absolutely true. But hearing it from somebody who, uh, you know, has been in the world of letters, Maureen, and read as much as you have and, and done everything that you've done, is again, it's, it's permission in a way that's important. And I think that we need to give it to each other. Yeah. You can do it by saying that was really good, or here's the good part, here's what you could do better. Right. And we need that. That community of writer stuff is really important. Yeah, right. All right. Did Gina give a vision for the book cover or did the artist come to her with the concept? Um, I, uh, I had an idea of it. And then um, it was just like a lot of women sort of moving around, like in flight in. And but Miranda realized it in such an amazing way. And if you see all the different kinds of people who are in here and they're just, they're sort of representative of the essays, but the manuscript was really just on its way um, as she got started on it. So, uh, so no, Miranda really gets uh, full credit for uh, making this happen. And, and, you know, one of the things that people, especially if they haven't uh, had the chance to do a book themselves is that they don't realize that um, covers are a marketing concept. Um, you know, we talk about The Great Gatsby. The Great Gatsby is what, what like 117 different covers and it's different iterations, right? Yeah. And all of them look like they would be for wildly different books. Yes, like, yeah, yeah. What does this book have to do with this book? I mean, this is, and they're, you know, uh, it, it's, it's wonderful to be able to uh, work with an artist on a cover. And, you know, Mimi Pond, the great um, graphic artist herself, whose uh, book, over Easy was a New York Times bestseller um, about her time as a, a waitress in Haight-Ashbury. And now she's doing a book on the Mitford sisters. And she has an essay in, the, in Fast Funny Women and agreed to do, you know, the, I love the laughing Medusa with all of the different um, versions of women. So it's just, it's great to be able to work with artists who can make things happen. And I mean, I have no talent whatsoever in that. And it's just great to see somebody bring that yeah. to play. Okay, that also was Laura's question and she responded and said, thank you. And I just fainted by these generous comments. So <laughs> I just wanted to share that, update you. But our next question, who are some of the contemporary fierce women role models you admire? Hmm. Well, well, this week, certainly uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson. I mean, to talk about having having to have the presence and the grace to be able to sit there and think while all of this stuff is happening around you and you're getting some pretty, um, in my opinion, nasty questions leveled at you and, and 
and not lose yourself, hold on to yourself, you know, be true to yourself. So I, I, I find her really inspiring and, um, yeah, she's, she, uh, you know, I mean, the news is just packed with fierce women, right? I mean, those images from Ukraine of, of women who are carrying children, carrying dogs, <laughs> carrying suitcases, um, and, living through, I can't even imagine, uh, caring for their loved ones uh, is, is just so powerful. Yeah, I think that's right. And I was, um, I felt like losing, like I was losing a relative when I heard about Madeleine Albright. Yeah. I had yeah. been sending out her essay um, uh, about uh, the one that she published in the Times a couple of weeks ago to, to people and saying this seems like that she knew when she looked at Putin and, and said he was just such a small, unfriendly little you know, man and not in some, you know, I, I don't think it had anything to do with height. I think being a little man is a, you know, it's sort of a different category. And, um, and it, it was a great example of a very, like specific way of describing a person and that I, you know, I trusted her so completely. Yeah. It's a description of why he's scary on every level that doesn't have to do with, you know, nation building and whatever, but that he himself as a human being or what passes as a human being was a scary creature. And, and that, that she felt that immediately in being in his presence. Mm -hmm. um, it was just it was just a terrific op-ed piece, and um, and I really and I, I just remember. In fact, I think it might have been Roxanne of saying, talking about having met her once, and that she was, let's just say, she was very straightforward and blunt and funny, and it sounded like, you know, she was somebody that would have been great. Have you, did you ever meet her? No, I, I never met her. Circles. Um, it just sounds at Georgetown, so, so yeah, well, I somehow don't... our classrooms didn't intersect. <laughs> But she, uh, yeah, she said she was somebody great. And, you know, I mean, I, and I just, you know, I really selfishly just went to for a checkup at the hospital for this rotator cuff surgery that I had a while back. And, you know, the staff, the doctors, the nurses, the, you know, the, the PT people, people who like, again, through these last couple of years, these are people who show up and do stuff. Yeah. I mean, they're great. And I think that they mostly, I always try to, and again, I don't get any like angel power for this, but I always try to write a nice note on mm -hmm. those surveys because I think that mostly people who fill those things out complain. Oh, yeah. You know, they yeah. get a compliment. It's like when you write something, yeah. you mostly get people who are angry or disgruntled. Right. Just get something that says, oh, like you did a nice job or that was fun. Yeah. Yeah. But your belief, right, as opposed to somebody who wants to argue with you? Yeah. What you left out, you're not perfect either. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, right. It's, so. All right. Lovely answers. I love those. All right. Our next question. Do you have a lot of men read or review your book? If so, what do those reviews look like? Interesting. Yeah. Um, yes. The nice thing is that, and you know, I, I don't pay them by check or anything. I mean, there really are uh, Jay Heinrichs. I mean, who's a friend, but um, who is another New York Times bestseller who who wrote "Thanks for Arguing." Thank you for arguing, and um, he's he was one of the first people to review at least Fast Funny Women. And I hope that everybody listening who gets a copy from R.J. Julia's or got one from Politics and Pros will go write reviews wherever they can or um, just put something up on Facebook about the book because it is word of mouth. These are the little books. I mean, right. Amazon is not going to do a series based on this. Like people are going like, why can't they just do a series on it? It's like, I, uh, I don't think that's how it works. It's like everybody thinks like, oh no, wouldn't, if you sent it to Kate Blanchett, wouldn't she want to be in play? <laughs> I, 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 Laura's a publicist. I think she works hard on trying to get the book attention. I don't think it's going to Kate Blanchett. Um, although, Kate, if you're watching, please do. Uh, so it's, um, it's getting into, it's like, what, it, and Maureen, I don't know if you get the same kind of thing. I always get asked, like, do, do young men take your classes? It's, mm. I feel like I have, yes, I have young men in my classes. And the great thing, I have more women than men. 
But when the young men take the classes, when the guys take the classes, they keep taking them. Mm-hmm. So I right. get right. It, I get to know them from when they're sophomores, and then they'll take one class a year until they're seniors. And right. it's not only because I have food in the office. They're not <laughs> not just like feeding raccoons. It right. really, you know, but they they come back and you know they they become um, you know terrific pals. So. Yeah, I think the only reason why we both have fewer men in our classes, mostly women, is because the English major itself is considered, has always been historically considered to be oh, somehow a feminized field of study. And, you know, despite the fact that, again, for centuries, the great writers were considered to be men. Yeah, it, yeah so it... <sighs> Go figure, go figure. Go figure. That's, that's, that's the subject of another book, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. What was your favorite part about working with all these amazing and inspiring women? Uh, I think it, it's embedded in the question. It was working with these amazing and inspiring women. I mean, I think that um, it's, it's and I'm doing, you know, the next book now, which is Fast Fallen Women that'll come out next year. <laughs> and um, and so the definition of fallen is very much um, along the same lines. There's lots of ways to be fallen. And, um, and people telling their stories and feeling like they can tell their stories. And it doesn't mean that every single one of those essays will make it into the book. But, um, but again, I like working with writers of all different stripes and kinds and backgrounds. And so it's, um, it's, it's a pleasure that people trust me with their stories and then will trust me to help them edit or to, to get, you know, um, to try to make it better because that's always my only instinct in, in working with something and to try to get it to 750 words to say all great literature holds a mirror up to life and, and short flash fiction holds or nonfiction holds a compact mirror. I would, I would think, um, Gina, that it would also be interesting. Like when, when you've got this assemblage of essays together, uh, you, you do start to see themes. I mean, obviously it's not a novel, it's a essay collection, but, um, you know, I'm thinking of Carolyn Levitt's essay, which we haven't talked about, which is so, so, so Carolyn, great. fabulous. And about, you know, gaining weight and seeing a friend who you haven't seen in a long time, who's sort of a friend, but also a professional colleague who then rejects you because you don't fit into the image of, you know, what, what the friend uh, wants for her magazine. And I'm not going to spoil that essay. Everybody should buy the book and read it. But um, the way it turns at the end and Caroline re- kind of reclaims herself, you know, th- that happens in a lot of essays and it doesn't feel false. It just feels like somehow I've come to terms with um, this difficult thing about myself or about the world I'm in and, you know, learn to live with it. Oh, thank you. I, I think that Caroline's, again, is one of those ones. It's the first essay in the book. And, and Caroline is just an amazing writer. And again, another, you know, a generous um, uh, part of the writer community where she's always reaching out to other people and, and making people's lives better. And she, uh, another friend of RJ Julia's, right? I think you're doing an event at, R- she's doing an event at RJ Julia's coming up or just had one, Caroline Levitt. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so, you know, it's this sort of coven <laughs> <laughs> the right word. I don't know why that's coming from. <laughs> um, it's coven of women writers. And so that, um, and then the people like Ebony Murphy Root, who's a former student of mine, is on the West Coast, and writing about getting a life coach. Yeah. And just like, the, like, no, this is like, this is not how Ebony Murphy Root is going to go through <laughs> like listening to this little squinty lady telling her, you know, the different <laughs> Facebook friends and real friends so that yeah having everybody come and sort of um uh, it it's it's just been uh it, it has been amazing and as as uh Maureen just said that by the time you get to the end of them they're satisfying yeah um it, they're short but they're satisfying because they really are they're like those you know, miniature hedgehogs that people have it's like <laughs> roll into those little balls and <laughs> 
it's like, oh, it's like it's a complete thing. It's this little complete living thing. It's just become it. But it's but they're not fake. I mean, and no, that, they're not fake. They're, they're not pat. And I ha I love short pieces of writing. I mean, I, I love the 1920s and the 20s is all about, you know, Dorothy Parker and that whole guy. Everybody's writing short stuff. Gatsby is so short, you know, um, there's there's something really, uh, I think, powerful about these condensed works that sometimes almost read like poetry. Yes, absolutely. And and that it's um, it snaps into place. Yeah. Yeah. So that feel like you can, and again, that means so many of us read, our lives are so fragmented that we read 20 minutes before bed. Are you reading? Right. At, and I know that your last, the RJ Julia's famous last question. What are right. we reading? Yes, you beat me to it. That's the question. <laughs> what are you guys Big, reading? Heavy recommendation. I will be talking about this on Fresh Air. Um, next week, uh, Douglas Stewart won the Booker Prize for his debut novel, Shuggy Bain, um, last year. And oh, the year, uh, my sense of time is blown away with the pandemic. But to you, this is his new novel. Um, spectacular. He, he, He's writing about a, a, a young boy who's gay, growing up in you know, poor Scotland. None of the cliches, none of the stereotypes, everything is fully realized. It's funny, it's heartbreaking. Also kind of a suspense story, um, this one. So five stars. <laughs> that's great. Young Mungo, that's the name. I haven't said the name, Young Mungo. And that's where, that's what, their publicist needs to get is Maureen Corrigan saying this about the the book. And that's the not for resale. That's the advanced copy. I'm reading this because this is what I'm teaching. So you can tell that I'm teaching it because there were parts of the book. <laughs> what is it? I didn't catch the cover. It is The Robber Bride by Margaret Atwood. I'm teaching a course in the novels of Margaret Atwood and Thomas uh, Hardy. And, um, and so it's my students are reading 500. This one is, what is this? It's uh, 508 pages, 512 pages. And they like, as in my pages show, their pages look the same way where they've got everything written on it because no electronic devices in my classes. They yeah. bring a book and they bring in a paper notebook and then we talk. And that's how it goes. So I haven't read Atwood's newest collection of essays. I haven't gotten it yet. I'm really looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, I think that's that's the next on the list, but I, I'm i looking forward to Young Mongo. Mongo, Mongo you're going to love it. I'm going to love it. That's great. <laughs> All right, we are unfortunately out of time. I wish we could keep this going for another hour, but we unfortunately can't. Thank you so much to both Gina and Maureen for being Thank here you. tonight. Do not forget to purchase a copy of Fast Fierce Women. Links are in the chat so you can easily purchase your copy there. We have signed copies at Madison RJ Julia. You can come visit us in store or click the links in the chat. Thank you both again for being here tonight and I hope you all have a great rest of your night. Oh, thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Thank you Gina. Thank you, Maureen. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs>